Hi, and welcome back to Vet Imaging Lab. In today's lecture, we'll cover the three essential ultrasound modes used in veterinary echocardiography, B mode, M mode, and Doppler mode. You'll also master the difference between color and spectral Doppler, and see how each is used in clinical practice. To assess blood flow direction, velocity, and patterns, let's dive in. To fully assess the heart, we use three main echocardiographic modes, two-dimensional imaging or B-mode, M-mode or motion mode, and Doppler mode. B-mode or two-dimensional imaging is the standard mode used for anatomical evaluation. It provides a real-time grayscale image, allowing us to assess overall cardiac anatomy, such as the heart's chambers, valves, and major vessels. And B-mode enables us to observe the real-time motion of the cardiac walls and valves throughout the cardiac cycle, both during systole and diastole. This makes it essential for evaluating chamber size, wall movement, and overall heart structure. As you can see on B-mode, we can clearly assess the mitral valve's shape and movement throughout the cardiac cycle. During diastole, the mitral valve opens with a sharp linear shape, allowing blood to flow from the left atrium to the left ventricle. Then, during systole, the mitral valve should close straight and completely, preventing any backflow into the atrium. But in this dog with myxomatous mitral valve disease, MMVD, you can see a distinct abnormality in the mitral valve movement. The tip of the anterior mitral leaflet is noticeably thickened. And during systole, instead of closing properly, the valve prolapses into the left atrium. This abnormal motion leads to mitral regurgitation, where blood leaks back into the atrium instead of flowing forward efficiently. Now, let's look at another important B-mode application, assessing ventricular shape and pressure overload. Here, we have two echocardiographic images obtained from a right parasternal short axis view. On the left, we see a normal heart, where the left ventricle maintains its typical round shape. On the right, this dog has right ventricular pressure overload. Notice how the interventricular septum is flattened instead of curving naturally. This D-shaped left ventricle is a hallmark of conditions like pulmonary hypertension or right-sided heart disease. Like this, B-mode is essential because it allows us to evaluate both structural shape changes and dynamic motion changes at the same time providing critical insights into cardiac function. M-mode or motion mode is derived from B-mode imaging, but instead of showing a full two-dimensional image, it represents motion over time along a single scan line. M-mode is particularly valuable for tracking movement over time and measuring chamber sizes and wall thickness with precision. Hear how M-mode imaging is generated. First, we obtain a parasternal long axis or short axis view in B mode to identify the area of interest. Then, a single vertical scan line, an M mode cursor, is placed across the heart's structures, typically through the left ventricle. The ultrasound machine continuously records echoes along the scan line over time, displaying the left ventricular motion as a waveform graph on the screen. Based on the graph, we can measure chamber dimensions, wall thickness, and assess contractility. Here we have an example of an M-mode image. This was captured by placing the M-mode cursor through the left ventricle at the level of the papillary muscles. With this, we can track the movement of the interventricular septum, the left ventricular internal dimension, and the left ventricular wall over time. You can see that it's divided into two phases. During diastole, which is marked by the yellow line, the left ventricle relaxes and fully expands, allowing blood to fill the chamber. Then, during systole, indicated by the blue line, the left ventricle contracts, reducing its internal dimension as it pumps blood out. On the left side of the screen, we have some key measurements. These include the thickness of the interventricular septum and the left ventricular wall, as well as the left ventricular internal dimension. By analyzing these measurements, we can detect abnormalities like hypertrophy, dilation, or impaired contraction, which are important indicators of heart disease. Take a look at these illustrations. On the left, we see a normal heart with a balanced wall thickness and internal dimension. In concentric hypertrophy, which occurs due to pressure overload, the heart muscle thickens, 
but the internal chamber size remains the same, or even gets smaller. This is commonly seen in conditions like systemic hypertension or aortic stenosis. On the other hand, eccentric hypertrophy develops from volume overload, where the internal chamber enlarges while the wall thickness may appear relatively thinner. This is typical in cases like mitral or aortic regurgitation, where the heart has to handle an increased blood volume. By assessing wall thickness and internal chamber dimensions using M-mode imaging, we can objectively evaluate whether the heart is undergoing hypertrophy and determine if it's due to pressure or volume overload. Now, let's move on to Doppler imaging. To accurately interpret Doppler ultrasound, we first need to understand the concept of the Doppler shift. Doppler shift is the key principle that allows us to measure blood flow velocity and direction in echocardiography. Let's first explore the Doppler shift using this simple illustration. On the left, we have the probe, and on the right, we have an object. When the probe emits ultrasound waves and the object is not moving, the returning sound waves have a same frequency with the transmitted waves. When a moving object, this represents red blood cells in a vessel, move toward the probe, the returning sound waves have a higher frequency than the transmitted waves. This is called a positive Doppler shift, and it appears as a signal moving toward the transducer. On the other hand, when blood cells move away from the probe, the returning sound waves have a lower frequency than the transmitted waves. This is a negative Doppler shift, indicating blood flow moving away from the transducer. This Doppler shift forms the foundation of Doppler ultrasound, allowing us to analyze blood flow direction, velocity, and turbulence within the heart and vessels. Using this principle, we can apply two main types of Doppler imaging in echocardiography, color Doppler and spectral Doppler. Now, let's take a closer look at what we can evaluate with color Doppler. Color Doppler helps us assess two key aspects of blood flow, direction and velocity. Direction is determined using the BART map, blue away, red toward. This tells us whether blood is moving toward or away from the transducer. Velocity is indicated by the brightness of the color. Higher velocities result in brighter shades of red or blue. And color Doppler can assess the flow pattern, such as laminar flow, or turbulent flow. Laminar flow means blood moves smoothly in parallel layers, all in the same direction, with a relatively uniform velocity. In normal vessels and heart chambers, laminar flow is observed. However, in certain conditions, like valvular regurgitation or septal defects, blood flow becomes turbulent. Turbulent flow is chaotic, with rapid changes in direction and velocity. Here are color flow Doppler images obtained from two different dogs using the left apical four-chamber view. On the left, we have a normal heart. The blood flow from the left atrium to the left ventricle appears as a smooth, uniform red color, indicating laminar flow. This means the blood is moving in an organized and stable manner without significant disturbances. On the right, we see a case of mitral regurgitation where blood leaks back into the left atrium during systole. This abnormal flow creates turbulence, which is seen as a mix of multiple colors in a chaotic pattern. This mosaic appearance on Doppler imaging represents rapid variations in blood flow direction and velocity. It provides a clear visual representation of blood movement, helping us identify abnormal flow patterns. So color Doppler is excellent for quickly distinguishing between laminar flow and turbulent flow at a glance. However, since it is a type of pulsed wave Doppler, it has a velocity limitation known as the Nyquist limit. This can sometimes lead to aliasing, where high velocity flows appear as an artificial color reversal. We'll revisit this concept in more detail when we discuss spectral Doppler in this lecture. Now let's move on to spectral Doppler which provides a more detailed analysis of blood flow compared to color Doppler. Spectral Doppler gives us precise numerical data on blood flow velocity and helps assess pressure gradients. 
You can see here a Doppler spectrum with a baseline in the center. Flow above the baseline represents blood moving toward the transducer, commonly displayed as positive values. Flow below the baseline indicates blood moving away from the transducer, negative values. The shape and intensity of these waves help assess normal and abnormal blood flow patterns. On the right, this is an actual spectral Doppler waveform from a cardiac scan. The height of the wave represents the velocity of blood flow in meters or centimeters per second. Sharp, well-defined waveforms usually indicate normal flow, while irregular or high-velocity signals can suggest turbulence or obstruction. There are two types of spectral Doppler, such as continuous wave Doppler and pulsed wave Doppler. Each has unique advantages and is used in different clinical situations. Let's talk about continuous wave or CW Doppler first. CW Doppler uses two crystals, one continuously sending ultrasound waves, and the other receiving ultrasound waves. Because it continuously measures all blood flow along the beam, it can detect very high velocities, making it ideal for assessing conditions like severe stenosis or regurgitation. However, since it samples everything along the beam, it lacks precise depth information, meaning we cannot pinpoint exactly where the velocity is coming from. Unlike CW Doppler, pulsed wave Doppler, or PW Doppler, uses a single crystal. A single crystal first sends out ultrasound waves, then it stops transmitting and switches to receiving returning echoes for a short period. After receiving, it stops again and starts a new cycle of sending and receiving again. Because of this on and off process, PW Doppler can only capture a limited number of returning signals within a certain time frame. This limit is called the Nyquist limit. The Nyquist limit is the maximum velocity which PW Doppler can accurately measure. Without the signal, gets distorted. So, in PW Doppler, the signal becomes distorted when the velocity exceeds the Nyquist limit. We call this signal distortion aliasing. However, PW has advantages that this allows us to measure flow at a specific location, making it useful for evaluating precise intracardiac velocities in areas like the mitral inflow or left ventricular outflow tract. In summary, CW Doppler is best for measuring high velocities, but it sacrifices spatial resolution. PW Doppler is excellent for site-specific measurements, but it has a velocity limit due to aliasing. Oh, do you remember that? Color Doppler is also a type of PW Doppler, as we discussed earlier. That's why aliasing occurs in areas of high-velocity flow on color Doppler imaging, just like in PW Doppler. To fully evaluate cardiac function, both CW and PW Doppler should be used together based on the specific cardiac condition. Now, let's take a look at color and spectral Doppler application using an example from a normal dog. We see a left apical four-chamber view focusing on the left ventricular outflow tract. The color Doppler overlay shows a laminar flow pattern, meaning smooth and organized blood flow. The blue color indicates that blood is flowing away from the transducer, which is expected in this view of the left ventricular outflow tract. On the right, we have the pulsed wave Doppler, recording from the same location. The spectral Doppler waveform shows a clean, narrow velocity profile, further confirming laminar flow. The peak velocity is around 175 centimeters per second, which is within the normal range for the left ventricular outflow tract. By combining color Doppler and spectral Doppler, we can assess both blood flow direction and velocity, ensuring there are no obstructions or abnormal flow patterns. Now let's look at a case of aortic stenosis and see how spectral Doppler helps us evaluate abnormal blood flow. On the left, we have a B-mode image of the aorta where we can identify the stenotic lesion causing an obstruction to blood flow. In the color Doppler image, we see turbulent flow appearing as a chaotic mix of colors due to high velocity and disorganized movement. This is a classic finding in stenotic regions. When applying spectral Doppler, 
in the pulsed wave Doppler tracing, we can see aliasing, meaning the velocity has exceeded the Nyquist limit, causing an overlapping signal. So, we cannot measure the accurate velocity of the turbulent flow. However, the CW Doppler beam, which you can see here as the yellow line, detects all velocities along its path. This means it's excellent for capturing high-velocity flow, but we cannot determine exactly where the abnormal flow is coming from. So, while CW Doppler is great for measuring peak velocity, it doesn't give us precise spatial localization. In contrast, PW Doppler uses a gate to sample velocity from a specific site within the heart. As you can see in this image, the yellow gate is placed in the area of interest, and the Doppler spectrum reflects the velocity at that exact location. This makes it ideal for assessing flow in areas, like the mitral valve inflow, left ventricular outflow tract, or specific shunt lesions. This is why PW and CW Doppler are complementary. PW helps with localization, while CW allows us to measure high velocities without aliasing. By combining both techniques, we can get a more complete picture of intracardiac blood flow and hemodynamics. Now, let's summarize today's key points. When performing a cardiac ultrasound examination, we start by using B mode to evaluate the heart structures, such as the valves, chamber walls, and internal dimensions, identifying any anatomical abnormalities. B mode also allows us to assess real time cardiac motion during systole and diastole. Next, we use M mode to precisely measure the heart's wall thickness and chamber dimensions, enabling us to identify cardiac remodeling and classify hypertrophic changes accurately. Then we apply color Doppler to visually detect abnormal blood flow patterns. If any abnormal flow is observed, we proceed to spectral Doppler to quantify the blood flow velocities. With spectral Doppler, PW Doppler helps pinpoint the exact location of abnormal flow. While CW Doppler accurately measures high blood flow velocities without aliasing, to achieve an accurate and comprehensive cardiac evaluation, it is essential to integrate. That wraps up today's lecture on veterinary echocardiography. I hope this video helped you clearly understand how to use B mode, M mode, and Doppler modes to thoroughly evaluate cardiac function. If you found this lecture helpful, please give us a thumbs up, leave your questions or comments below, and don't forget to subscribe to Vet Image Lab for more practical veterinary imaging tips. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.